Thank you everyone for joining. This is incredibly exciting and you know, use of technology that I've never done before. So I think this is a very cool way to have really interesting conversations um, online in a way that's participatory for everybody. Um, before I start, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement. So I'm here uh, situated in the city of Markham in Ontario, Canada. Um, and so the land in which I gather um, is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Ashinabek, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Scugog, the Hayawata, and the Alderville First Nations, as well as the Métis. This territory was the subject of the Dish with the One Spoon Wampum Belt Convention, um, which is an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources of this land. As we discuss genocide, I think it's really important to um, also think about the ways in which genocide occurs where I'm situated in Canada and in other places around the world too and the erasure uh, of um, Indigenous people and Indigenous voices in the lands in which we settle. Um, so I guess I'll give a very brief introduction into me um, before we start this conversation. My name is Archna. I am the Senior Advocacy Officer for Pearl in Canada. I work with two amazing ladies um, who are part of the advocacy team in Canada. And we basically connect with governments at the provincial, federal level, as well as our MPs and other um, you know, individuals trying to advocate for justice and accountability um, in Sri Lanka. And um, it, Tasha will be joining me. Tasha is, you know, one of my sheroes and honestly one of the coolest people that I know. I just got to know her recently, but I've learned so much even in the short time that we've spent together. Um, Tasha is the founder and the director of Pearl. She currently works as the senior policy advisor at the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, she spent over uh, a year documenting human rights violations committed against Tamils in the north and east of Sri Lanka and remains committed to pursuing accountability for the mass atrocities. She received her BA uh, in Peace and um, Justice and Peace Studies from Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service and she received her law degree from Yale which is like very awesome and cool and I'm so glad that we're able to do this. Um, as a brief uh, introduction into this particular um, session we wanted to talk about genocide which I think is a very important you know issue and topic for our struggle, um, you know, but the discussion on genocide is often very legal and complicated. And we wanted to look at genocide from various perspectives, including the legal perspective, in a way that's accessible. And I think it's part of like democratizing law. Gen we are all part of advocating for genocide recognition for what happened to the Tamil community in Sri Lanka. And so it's important that we all know what it is that we're advocating for. Um, so this will work as a question and answer period. I will ask Tasha some questions and she'll be providing her thoughts and legal analysis. And then the last 15 minutes of the discussion, um, I'll open it up to you if you have any questions and we'll answer um, anything that you may you know, want to talk about about genocide. Um, this we envision it to be a part of a series. So today we're going to be focusing on genocide within the context of Black July. Um, but we know we're planning on having further series on this, talking about Muli Baikal and other um, areas, areas or issues that might be of interest to you. Um, so why don't we just get started? Do you want to say something before we start, Tasha? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Archana, for that kind introduction. Um, very excited to be here. We've never done this before, so stick stick with us, please. Um, and just wanted to note the the required disclaimer um, that my views here are my own and pearls, and not representative of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. Um, but yeah, just very excited. Thank you all for joining us. All right. And before we started, I also wanted to um, put out a trigger warning, you know, that the things that we're going to be discussing can be very difficult for every for people and um, is a very heavy work. And so if you ever feel uncomfortable, please feel free to, you know, um, take space from this conversation. We will be recording it. So it will be there for you later if you want to review it. Make sure that you prioritize your mental health because we know that this is very difficult. Um, all right. So let's get started. Um, let's start with the basics. What? Like what, where does genocide come from? Like what are the origins of the term genocide? 
So the term itself um, was originated in 1944 by a Polish Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, um, and he used the term to describe the Nazis' systemic destruction um, of national and ethnic groups and, of course, the Jews there. Um, and its uh, roots are Greek and Latin. Um, the Greek prefix genos, meaning race or tribe, um, combined with the Latin suffix side, meaning killing, um, to create the term genocide. Um, so that's like the kind of origins of where that ter the term itself comes from. But we know that it's been codified um, into like a legal uh, a legal definition. What is the legal definition, and um, where where what elements of it? Where does it come from? Where is it codified? So the legal definition itself is codified in the Genocide Convention. Um, and under the convention, genocide involves a genocidal act or acts that are committed with the genocidal intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And we'll get to some of the issues with this, with this definition a little bit later, but just so everyone um, has an understanding of the, the precise legal definition itself, um, the five acts that are considered to constitute genocide include killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction, um, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, and lastly, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Right. And so, um, you know, as of most criminal laws, genocide has um, the, like, the intent person the intent portion of it and then the act portion of it so the intent within the genocide is um it needs to be an intent to destroy in whole or in part right so that's like the intent element that if we ever try to um find find the genocide um definition that's what we need to prove um which can be difficult as we will discuss later on um where does this definition of genocide come from where was it developed So the, the, the term and um, the definition really came from Raphael Lemkin um, um, back in, in the 50s, and sorry, the 40s. Um, and the, his initial conception of the term genocide um, was really more expansive than what it is today and what has been codified in international criminal law. Um, but the term itself um, was meant to underscore the fact that individuals were being attacked specifically because they were part of a collective people. Um, and the thinking there was that this type of killing is, is almost worse than other types of killing um, because it's not necessarily personal, um, but it's more about um, trying to kill um, a specific part or a specific group because they are a member um, or because they identify um, as that group. Um, so the UN General Assembly officially made genocide an international crime on December 9th, 1948 by adopting the Genocide Convention. Um, and unfortunately, the convention's definition and the definition in international criminal law were watered down from Lemkin's original vision um, because Lemkin's conception really centered around cultural destruction. Um, but the definition in international law really focuses on physical and biological destruction. Um, so this doesn't include cultural, political, or economic destruction. Um, and sort of interestingly, the U.S. and the U.K. pushed, um, unfortunately, very successfully to weaken Lincoln's de definition um, so that they could protect themselves against genocide allegations arising from the treatment of Black people in the U.S., um, and the treatment of Africans in the UK's colonies throughout the continent. Um, and su sort of surprisingly, the French and Soviets supported Lemkin's original, more broader definition, um, even though that would have enabled their atrocities in Algeria and Ukraine, um, for example, to be considered genocide. Right. So, so I guess it's fair to say that the legal definition of genocide is very narrowly construed um, and apply very certain acts against very certain people and certain groups. Um, so what was so significant about the legal codification of genocide and other atrocity crimes? 
So this is, is hugely significant, um, especially for, for justice and accountability efforts for all communities. Um, but because of the codification in the Genocide Convention, now states can be held responsible both for committing genocide as well as for failing to prevent and punish genocide. Um, and the emergence of international criminal law after the Holocaust and World War II, um, as exemplified by the Rome Statute of the ICC, the International Criminal Court, criminalizes war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, and as a result, individuals can now be investigated, tried, and convicted for mass atrocity crimes. So those three crimes count as atrocity crimes? Yes. Um, definition? Okay. Um, I think one of the things that I know in my studies was this idea of genocide as being like the crime of crimes. I think when the UN um, General Assembly, um, you know, incorporated the, the, the like the crime of genocide in their um, remarks, they said that this was something that shocked the conscience of humanity, something that would that should never, ever happen again. And so it was codified. Um, and then unfortunately, we saw you know, prosecutions under this, you know, crime that should never have happened after the Holocaust, um, you know, in Rwanda and in, um, you know, other areas around the world. So it's a very significant crime and it's very significant that it's been codified. And I think it kind of pushes people's responsibility to ensure that if something like this occurs, which it shouldn't, people are, you know, should definitely, um, search for accountability for it and states have a responsibility to search for accountability for it. Um, so, you know, continuing on in that discussion, like what are the different means of achieving accountability for genocide, this like crime of all crimes? So law provides for state responsibility um, under the Genocide Convention and international criminal responsibility under international criminal law um, and has been in, in in some places incorporated into domestic law of specific countries. Um, unfortunately, no state has been held responsible for genocide to date, but the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, has recognized the mass atrocities in Srebrenica as genocide. Um, and individual architects of state-sponsored genocides of the 1990s have been convicted. Uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia has convicted military leaders and the former president roles in Srebrenica. Um, and there have been convictions of Rwandan genocidaires, um, including convictions for rape constituting genocide um, and showing that incendiary media leaders can also be held responsible for genocide. There have have been domestic trials um, in Canada, the US, and Western Europe, where genocidars have fallen under the jurisdiction of those countries. Um, I think it's really important to keep in mind, especially for the Tamil victim survivor community, how long these types of processes can take um, and to maintain really sort of honest and realistic expectations about this type of work. So, for example, the two most senior surviving members of the Khmer Rouge were convicted of genocide over 40 years after the Cambodian genocide in the 1970s. Um, so this just goes to show the, the, the road to justice is very long um, and very difficult. And I think that um, as the Tamil community, we need to be very mindful of that um, and maintain our, our expectations appropriately. Um, and of course, this is this is especially hard for the community um, on the ground in Ulam because they're the ones who are um, suffering the brunt of of the military occupation and of ongoing human rights abuses. Um, so, so sort of having to reconcile that with the nature and the flaws of international criminal law um, is is really. Um, uncomfortable and necessarily yields tension. Um, but I know we're going to get into that a little bit later. Sorry, Archana. Oh, that's incredibly important remarks. And, um, you know, I think it just puts the impetus on us that we know it's going to be a long road. We know it's going to take a very long time, but it's vital that we continue to do the work that we're doing and Pearl continues to do the work that it's doing because it's only, you know, like the evidence that we gather, the research that we do, the advocacy that we do now that will end up getting, you know, eventual results, right? So it's a long road, but we got to walk it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, 
do you have any perspectives? You know, we've talked about the legal understand legal limit, sorry, legal definition of genocide, and we've talked about how it's narrowly construed. Um, like, do you have any perspectives on that? Like, what this limited um, definition does on how we understand genocide as a community and across the world? Yeah, the legal definition is um, extremely flawed and extremely. Um, for these reasons um, that we've talked about, the intent element, the mens rea of the crime requiring specific intent to destroy a group in whole or in part um, is extremely prove. And in the absence of direct evidence, prosecutors have been inferring vital intent from substantial evidence. Um, but it's important to note that crimes against humanity and war crimes do not have the same high threshold for specific intent. Um, which means that crimes against humanity and war crimes are essentially easier to prove um, mm-hmm. and be shown sort of based on the acts alone without having to show that they were committed um, with that specific intent to destroy a people or part of a people. Um, and then also the legal definition is limited to biological and physical destruction. So cultural destruction is is not included, um, even though that was sort of the vision for the term genocide when Raphael Lemkin coined it. Right. Um, I just wanted to know, I know that people are asking some questions. If um, any, everyone could kind of hold off until the last 15 minutes or so to put in your questions, because, you know, by the time I get to the question and answer period, I might end up missing what you're doing in the chat. So please hold off on the questions. I think there's some really interesting ones that are being sent out, and then we can try answering them in the last 15 minutes of the presentation. Um, so, uh, Tasha, so we've talked about the legal definition and how it's very narrowly construed and this can be problematic for a lot of communities as they seek justice. Um, are there other types of gen- genocide recognition? Like, is it only the legal recognition or are there other things as well that people can look for? Fortunately, there's also political recognition, um, which is uh, a lot of where Pearl spends its time and effort. Um, So states can politically recognize the occurrence of genocide, which signals that a state has recognized their obligation to take action to prevent and punish genocide. Um, And we've seen this in other contexts. Since the 1990s, the U.S. has made genocide determinations regarding, for example, Bosnia, Rwanda, Darfur, and areas under the control of ISIS or Daesh. Um, And Canada has recognized genocides regarding Bosnia, Rwanda, um, areas under ISIS control, uh, and the Rohingya. So there um, can often be political recognition without legal recognition, and that's important to remember as we sort of work towards of recognition. Also important to remember, though, that political recognition necessarily means um, that states actually uphold their obligations to prevent and punish genocide. Um, so there are flaws sort of all throughout international law, but especially with respect to international criminal law and genocide. Right. So I guess it's part of our job, I think, as part of like advocacy, um, per, as part of engaging in advocacy and on Canada is pushing for like political recognition, but then calling people out on their responsibility if they do recognize politically to do the accountability and the justice piece because there's no point in just having the recognition and not doing anything to help the community right so it's like a two-part tripart tripart thing in the midst of all the complexity of law so interesting interesting things that we're doing um so now i'm going to pivot a little bit into genocide um and the application of genocide law and policy and things within the tamil community specifically um so Part of we created this series one to mark the 37th year since Black July, which we know um, a series of you know genocidal um, actions against the Tamil community in 1983, which you know pushed. Uh, I think like one sparked the into the civil war to push a lot of Tamil people to leave the island and seek refuge in the West. You know, it's like a very pivotal um, point for Tamils um, across the world. So as we mark the 37th anniversary, I think it's really important to talk about how genocide and how we understand genocide now applies to, you know, events like Black July and other events for the Tamil community. Um, So what are the key examples of Sri Lanka's genocide against the Tamil people? 
There are unfortunately many examples um, of Sri Lanka's example of Sri Lanka's genocide against the Tamil people. Muli Vaikal, um, the mass atrocities committed in 2009, um, is is uh, a prime example. Um, so in um, in Muli Vaikal in May of 2009, there was there's genocidal intent, and there were multiple acts of genocide committed. By the Sri Lankan state against the Tamil community. Um, so we saw mass killings, we saw um, serious bodily and mentally harm, um, and there were deliberately inflicted conditions of life um, to destroy the group. And, and as you noted, Archana, we're, we plan to do a, a follow-up um, to this Insta Live um, where we explore Muli Vaikal in, in greater depth because, um, again, that was such a uh, a significant moment for the Tamil community, um, um, obviously an extremely traumatic one. Um, in terms of other examples of Sri Lanka's genocide against the Tamil people, there have also been reports of acts to prevent Tamil births. Um, so examples of um, unconsented to abortions for Tamil women, um, also unconsented to implants of birth control. Um, so there have been multiple reports um, throughout throughout the 90s, 1990s, earlier, um, and the 2000s, where the, the Sri Lankan government um, attempted to prevent Tamil births. Um, so Pearl is, is looking into this further, um, mm -hmm. and, and um, we'll continue exploring those issues. Um, and then turning to Black July specifically, um, the, the genocidal intent um, can be shown through the government's actions um, in which the government provided Sinhalese mobs with voter registration lists. So showing where Tamils lived, where their businesses were, um, and then also actually physically transporting these Sinhalese mobs around Colombo um, in government buses, mm -hmm. um, providing the eyes to go out and attack the Tamil community. Um, so that, that and combined with statements from um, Sri Lankan leaders, then President Jayawardena at the time, um, stating that um, if he killed all the Tamils, if he starved all the Tamils, um, the Sinhalese would be happy um, and really disparaging the value of Tamil life um, and really um, inciting and encouraging this type of violence to take place. Yeah. Um, and then in terms of the acts, um, the same acts that were seen um, in Muli Baikal on a smaller scale, um, of course, were seen in, in Black July. Um, there was killing, um, at least 3,000 Tamils were killed, um, serious bodily harm, um, and inflicting conditions of life to bring about the group's physical destruction. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it is important to know um, again, how significant Black July was to the Tamil community. Um, I think every family has been touched by Black July in some way. I know my family has stories about it. Um, I have cousins who hid under the bed when um, the Sinhalese mobs came and they only um, survived because my grandmother held up their US passports and said, you can't come in, you can't hurt us, they're, um, they're American. Mm -hmm. um, really the first time I sort of confronted the privilege that I have as a, an American Tamil person um, right. and the sort of security implications that has when dealing with the Sri Lankan state. Um, so I'm sure you have stories as well from, from within your family. And I yeah. think it's important as we commemorate the 37th anniversary to, to reflect on those stories and to Think about what that means for the community, both in the diaspora, but obviously, of course, in in Nulam, in the homeland, and um, what it means to have survived multiple acts of genocide like this. Who survived Black July? Who survived Muli Baikal? Who survived, you know, the the whole chain um, of of genocidal acts committed by the Sri Lankan government over the decades? Yeah. Totally right. I think um, Black July was seminal for my family as well. Um, and, you know, like one spurred the, my parents' decision, my dad's decision to, you know, leave Sri Lanka, but also I think really solidified my life in this, in the sense that since Black July and everything that's happened since then, you know, the, 
consistent messaging from my family has always been this is important like we were attacked because of who we are never forget that always push for accountability for that and so that's been like honestly like one of the major forces of my life too and so like black july is this incredibly important time that you know for the newer generations and for younger people it's really important that we think about that too um at this point i'll also like to plug the fact that like pearl um and tasha and other members of our legal team um released a uh article on a legal magazine called opinio juris which you know in more detail sets out the legal case of her genocide relating to Black July. So I recommend everyone to go check out the um, that article. And um, if you have trouble finding it, please let one of us know our messages and we can send it to you. It's also on our Instagram page. Um, again, I'm seeing some questions. Please hold up on your questions until the end, uh, the last 15 minutes so that I don't miss anything. Um, I do not want to miss your questions. Um, so, you know, we talked about our personal, you know, relations to genocide and to the Tamil struggle as well. Um, how do you view the Tamil struggle? And I'm not just talking about, you know, like the acts of genocide. I'm talking about, you know, since the 50s and like the decades of nonviolent um, resistance that the Tamil community, um, you know, did against uh, discriminatory laws and policies to finally like the end of you know the turn towards militarism um how do you view that that Tamil struggle like the entirety of it through the lens of genocide like I've seen and I've talked to people that just call all of it genocide is it all genocide or some parts of a genocide or just like Black July and Malik by call of it genocide and I know that this will be informed by like the fact that the legal definition, as we said, is very narrow and very construed. And so, like, how do how do we use that language? Yeah, it's challenging because of how narrowly defined the term is in international criminal law. Um, you know, there there are certainly examples of other types of of crimes committed against the Tamil people throughout um, Sri Lanka's history. And there's absolutely structural violence committed by the Sri Lankan state. Um, you referred to the discriminatory laws passed. There's the Singhala Only Act. There's um, Tamil pogroms, the 1958, 1977. Um, the sort of hallmark of cultural genocide, the burning of the Jaffna Library in, 19, in 1981. Um, you know, that was also such a significant moment for the Tamil community when, you know, tens of thousands of ancient Tamil manuscripts were, were burned. Um, and uh, I think uh, so much of ancient Tamil literature was lost um, in that moment and um, irreparably. Um, and then, of course, the, the moments leading up to Black July in 1983, um, the passage of the Prevention of Terrorism Act to allow the arbitrary arrest um, and essentially indefinite detention of um, Tamil political prisoners. Um, measure, which still continues today and is ridiculous how like draconian that law is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah still continues today. Um, and I think a lot of these, a lot of these issues are, are so heavy, um, because this oppression still continues. Like this is not a historical conversation by any means. This is, um, this is about, um, lived realities and lived experiences for the Tamil community. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, part of that question is like, are Black July and Mulevika the only instances of genocide? Like, are they the only legal instances of genocide? We've talked about how there's all this, you know, history of oppression that just doesn't fit within the very narrow, um, like the very narrow definition of what genocide is. But are, if we're just talking about that narrow defi definition, is it only Black July and Mulevika that we know of? Not necessarily. I think the the reports about um, forced sterilization, forced abortions are also uh, would also constitute genocide, even under the narrow legal definition. Um, and and there may be others. And Pearl continues to examine the facts and and legal arguments in support of other genocidal incidents and periods. Uh, and we encourage all of you to continue to follow our work um, as we investigate, analyze, and learn more. Mm -hmm. Um, 
So I guess this is like the big broad question. Why are we doing this? Why are we having this talk? Um, why are we talking about genocide? Why do we spend so much of our time advocating for genocide recognition? Like, why is genocide recognition important? So um, I think the, the main reason for why it's important for me personally is because the Tamil community in the Northeast identifies with that term. Um, okay. with of sort of suffered the most, um, continue to use that term to identify the atrocities that they've experienced. And I absolutely understand and agree with that. Um, and then I think stepping back and looking sort of more broadly at why genocide recognition um, is important more generally, um, I think it's important because it recognizes the gravity of the crimes committed, the atrocity crimes committed, um, and also provides a form of remembrance um, and prevents denial. Um, and genocide recognition is really multi-purposed. Um, it can mobilize international interventions um, because of the component in the genocide convention that requires states to act um, to prevent and punish genocide. Um, and it also can provide a form of redress for victims and their descendants. Um, so not all of us um, on here today are firsthand witnesses to mass atrocities, but the Tamil community has inherited the transgenerational cultural trauma transmitted by our parents um, and grandparents who are the direct genocide survivors. Um, and lastly, I think the genocide recognition is important to fulfill the international community's promise of never again. Um, and you those those words uttered um, after the Holocaust and unfortunately they've been broken more than they've been upheld by the international community since then. Yeah um, the uh, I also just wanted to note on top of that very powerful words Tasha was like we were we were looking through um, like the International Commission of Jurists um, work on what happened in Black July in like 1982 and back then Tamil people were saying this is genocide like the advocacy for genocide and the use of the term genocide sorry has been part of our um, struggle for decades you know and it continues to be so and I think it's really important that we feel empowered to use that word and to um, advocate within that context um, which leads into my next question so we know that there's been no legal accountability or recognition um, of Sri Lanka's genocide against the Tamil, the Tamil people. And um, I've, you know, once I started doing this advocacy work and I've talked to you and other people that have been doing this for a very long time, there is a tension because sometimes our opponents, like, you know, the Sinhalese government or um, other other groups or other people they say um no that you've never been this has never been recognized as genocide so why are you using that word like so liberally why do you consistently use that word all the time um why is it that one why is genocide recognition important for the Tamil community and two like why do you feel like why do you think that we should feel comfortable to use that that word and to use that when we're doing our advocacy efforts so I think our push for genocide recognition is is even more critical against the backdrop of our people living um, under the same regime that ordered genocide and other mass, mass atrocities against Tamil people um, in Ulam, and that is um, also present. Um, of Sri Lanka Gotabaya Rajapaksa was the defense secretary during the 2009 Muli Baikal genocide um, and the primary architect of it. Um, so it's, I think it's important to, to recognize that and to, um, to call it what it is um, because I think that'll inform the international responses um, to Sri Lanka today. Um, so I think if we can hold the Sri Lankan state accountable for genocide, and even if that's um, through political recognition instead of legal recognition, um, it would be a massive step towards justice and the prevention of future atrocities. And I think the tension that you speak of with, um, with other groups, um, Tamil diaspora, for example, who hesitate to call Muli Baikal or um, other episodes like Black July, um, a genocide, um, really stems from this discomfort um, within the 
the the genocide definition that has been codified in the genocide convention and sort of the high threshold requirements for um, the intent elements. Mm -hmm. And then also sort of stems from the international community's resistance to the language of genocide um, because of that, um, the because of the requirement to act that would then follow. Um, right. I think it's it's sort of more comfortable for everyone except the Tamil community if um, if what occurred was not considered a genocide because it's it's it essentially sits easier. Um, but I think that we as the Tamil diaspora um, shouldn't shy away from these uncomfortable truths and we should um, be pushing for what we know the Tamil community experienced um, and and force the international community to, to bear witness um, through calling what occurred a genocide. Right, and I totally agree and that informs, you know, as I said, our political work too. It's like advocating for genocide from a political perspective and then using that to leverage legal accountability. Um, and, in, and that's kind of what Pearl is trying to do from uh, in all the different countries that we work. And it's gonna be, it's very important work. Um, okay, so those are all the questions that I had planned and we have around 20 minutes left for questions. So um, Tasha, shall I ask any questions that the people have Okay, let me see. Let please um, include any questions um, in the chat and I will answer them. So the first one is, um, in the case of holding states accountable for genocide, are there also grounds to hold, sorry, are there also grounds to, uh, how do you answer this? I don't know, I can't figure it out either. <laughs> grounds to hold governments who have aided and um i guess abetted sri lanka to account as well i think that's the question okay, okay. um so i don't think there have been any prosecutions for um aiding well i mean no state has been held accountable for genocide whether that's they committed it or they aided and abetted it right. um, starting there unfortunately um I don't. I don't think that there are um, grounds um, through the Rome Statute, but um, perhaps through the um, International Court of Justice process, there may be. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, I think Darshika's question is about, um, you know, states that provided weapons, for example, to the Sri Lankan government, um, and there were many. Um, yeah. including were located in, unfortunately, um, whether they would be accountable for genocide committed by the weapons that they gave to the Sri Lankan government. Um, and I think it's a it's a really interesting question and, and um, would definitely want to do more um, research before I answered it definitively. Okay. Um, next question. D You've mentioned that the Tamil community back in Sri Lanka identifies events of Black July or Muli Vaikal as genocide. I was wondering, like, how much acceptance is there? How um, is there regarding the legal qualification? And are there divisions in the community regarding that? Um, there are divisions within the Tamil community regarding the whether um, what occurred to the Tamils um, is a genocide under the legal definition. Mm -hmm. um, there are, um, for example, Tamil political parties, um, the Tamil National Alliance um, in 2009 said what was happening um, in May um, in Malivaikal was a genocide. Um, if you talk to them today, they'll say it was not a genocide. Um, so I think you'll see that um, there are some, um, some approaches that are sort of less um, principled and, and less about the definition of genocide itself, um, as flawed as it is, and more about the political realities that face the Tamil community um, internationally and on the island itself. Um, so um, I think we, um, we have to be sensitive to that and understand that. Um, but also recognize the gravity of the crimes that were committed um, and recognize the um, that 
this to support our positions that what occurred in Black July um, and certainly in 2009 in Baikal were genocide. Okay, I guess this kind of leads to the, one of the next questions that is had. It's like, what is the point of talking about the past? Everyone already knows what happened in the past. Um, you know, what can Pearl, but also what can the Tamil community do to prevent future genocide? So I think um, it's it's important to talk about the past because what occurred in the past so informs what happens today. Um, so, you know, the, the easiest is Muli Baikal with Gotabaya Rajapaksa, um, organizing it, coordinating it, um, and implementing the mass atrocities against Tamil people in 2009, and then being ushered back into power last year, writing mm -hmm. of single nationalism. So I think until there is that reckoning and that confrontation with um, the true face of Singhala Buddhist nationalism um, as inherently racist, as inherently anti-Tamil. Um, we'll keep seeing episodes of violence um, and cycles of violence on the island. So I think that recognition is really important to break that cycle um, and to really provide um, a sustainable peace on the island um, because, um, you know, as has been said many times, uh, there can be no um, no reconciliation without accountability. You can't sweep these crimes and these um, atrocities on, committed on such a scale um, under the rug and then expect the Tamil community to sort of just live and suffer in silence. You see that, um, you know, in the opening that was provided um, when Sirisena was, was president, um, there was a small opening for dissent and the Tamil community seized on it. You know, there were hundreds of days of protests by families of the disappeared, others um, of the disappeared, really, calling for answers, calling for accountability, mm -hmm. um, to know what happened to their loved ones. Um, and I think that's really the most heartbreaking um, aspect of this type of work um, is is having to having to see the Tamil community on the ground um, live with the ongoing injustice and the ongoing. Um, suffering of not knowing exactly what happened to their loved ones um, who were disappeared, who were um, surrendered into government custody um, in May of 2009 um, and never seen again. Um, and that's not isolated to 2009. There have been disappearances throughout the conflict um, and, and that really shows the state-sponsored um, nature of these types of campaigns and of these um, types of violence um, against the Tamil community. Um, and I just um, want to note here, I've seen, um, I've seen parallels being drawn and just want to recognize the community um, in the States and around the world. But I know that um, there have been um, recent um, reports about um, state forces um, taking, capturing, detaining, um, and um, um, holding without trial Black protest members and, and um, protesters of other races as well. Um, and I think it's important that the Tamil community really stand as allies um, to those fighting against anti-Black racism as well. Of course, of course. Um, just hearing those, you know, like those reports of these unmarked vats capturing, you know, activists and taking them was so triggering for me because like, you know, that's what we feared, those white vans for so long. And the fact that it's happening here in what places that we consider safe and we sought refuge here is like incredibly difficult. And I think we have a responsibility too, and to also, you know, share in the burden with, you know, members of the black community as well. Um, I also wanted to note that, you know, like even today or yesterday, there were, um, uh, there were reports of, you know, state forces, like police forces um, intervening and surveillancing um, Tamil Ammas who were protesting in Batiklo. Like it's happening today, it's happening now. And what, from what I've, the people that I've talked to, it's gotten worse since Gota was elected in November 2019. So it's really important that we do the work that we're doing now. Absolutely. Yeah. And um and it's it's no surprise. You, I think if you look if you look back and if you look at, um, for example, the ceasefire period in Sri Lanka um, from two thousand two to two thousand and six, 
there was sort of a similar reopening um, of the Northeast and political activities continued. Human rights activists were sort of more comfortable um, in advocating for um, for human rights issues, to, um, to speak out against um, the attacks on, on um, civilians and the occupation. Um, and then after the ceasefire ended, um, you saw many of those human rights activists being intentionally targeted by mm -hmm. the state. Um, so there's always the concern that individuals who um, step up and speak out, um, even in moments of perceived calm, um, are then faced with reprisals um, once the, the Sri Lankan state returns to its sort of natural hardline single Buddhist stance. Um, mm -hmm. you know, Sri Lanka always does. Right. Um, all right, uh, next question. So the prosecution of Abre in um, Senegal was the result of victim groups pushing for the violations of the Conventions Against Torture, I think, the CAT. Um, do you think states would be more willing to take complaints of the um, Convention Against Torture to the ICJ? Yeah, and this is something that um, the Pearl is, is looking into and um, and exploring as well. Um, we we don't want to focus on genocide um, at the exclusion of other mass atrocity crimes. Um, we uh, absolutely recognize that um, other atrocity crimes don't face the same high threshold um, that the, gen the crime of genocide contains. Um, so we absolutely are exploring other human rights treaty body mechanisms um, to push for state accountability and responsibility. Okay, um, I guess I'll take one more question. Um, what is your advice to human rights activists on the island who want to take action and to speak out but are concerned, I think, about their personal safety? I, I don't know how to use technology. I don't know how to read the rest of that question, but I think that's what they're getting at. Either. I'm sorry. Um, uh, for individuals on the island, um, I would not want to um, presume to provide um, advice on how to navigate the security situation. I think that, um, you know, there are absolutely encrypted technologies that are available um, for, for messaging systems. And um, I would encourage the use of, of those types of um, programs, but um, I am absolutely not a cybersecurity expert um, and wouldn't um, um, presume to be in the best position to, to navigate that. Um, I would say um, be um, sensitive to the, to the, um, to the situation and, and speak to other activists on the ground to see how they're, um, they're best navigating it. Right. Um, and there was a, I think as we were ending towards, the, I think Instagram Live only gives us like an hour. So as we're going towards the end, um, one, I wanted to know that there were a lot of these really great questions. And unfortunately, we just don't have the time to answer them. But please do keep them um, in, please do keep them in mind. I wonder if, um, you know, next time we do sessions like this, like, We'd love to hear your questions again. Maybe we could just have like a Q&A question. Like, I don't know, because there's some really interesting questions here. Um, the second thing, something that a lot of people have been asking about is like, what are direct actions that people living in the diaspora can take? So within the context of Canada specifically, um, there's two elements. One, in I don't know if everyone knows this, but in June 2019, the Canadian House of Commons, you know, passed unanimously a motion that they would call on the United Nations to conduct an independent, impartial investigation into the crime of genocide as committed by Sri Lanka in May 2009. So since that um, motion was unanimously passed, we haven't heard anything about that or we haven't seen any steps taken on that. So I would really, really encourage you to contact your MPs and say, this was unanimously passed. Everyone's got the responsibility. It's been a year. What's being done? Um, secondly, for those people who live in Ontario, uh, everyone may know of Bill 104, which is like the Tamil Genocide Education Act. Um, pushing for Tamil genocide education within the period, within, within a seven day period ending on May 18th, um, just for the broader Tamil community. 
just for the broader community story, not just the Tamil community. Um, this bill is, uh, you know, sent to, it's being, um, it was sent to a standing committee. And um, so I would really push everyone in Ontario to talk to your MPPs as well and say, you know, make sure that this bill is passed um, and put the pressure because, you know, as we said, the legal definition is very narrow. Legal accountability is very long work. But political accountability is what we can do and what we have the power to do because we are the Tamil constituents. So push your states for political accountability. And then we can use that, I think, to leverage, you know, legal accountability as well. Pearl is working on, um, I don't know, it's super technical, so I don't really can't say about it, but um, I think Pearl is working on this tool that makes it very intuitive for you to um, message your MPs and your MPPs directly, sorry, uh, yeah, MPPs directly, so watch out for that within the Pearl space, and that should be probably be coming out in the next week or so, and then, um, you know, continue to engage with Pearl in our work, you know, we're constantly looking for, you know, we're constantly trying to do different things in the community, so, um, you know, continue to work with us, we'd love to hear you back in these sessions again, and um, looking forward to continuing this, like, really awesome discussion, and I'm so glad this happened, and we did this, Tasha. Do you want to end off? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Archana. Thanks for suggesting this conversation. I was totally unsure whether anyone would tune in to like a legal discussion of Black Here. July. <laughs> so I'm really excited you pushed for this and so happy to see, you know, nearly 50 of you have stayed through the conversation, which is really exciting. Um, I hope it's been informative and accessible. Um, and like Archana said, I hope you all stay in touch with Pearl's work and, and continue to um, learn more. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everybody. Take care and have a good day. Take care. Bye.